So I've done a few of these matter of character videos by now, and I'm sure more than a few of you have noticed that I tend to do these deep dives on characters that I really like, whether they're relatable to me or some part of their arc or their struggle resonates with some experience from my own life. You know, characters that I can honestly say are some of my favorites from their respective franchises. Well, time to throw that pattern right out the window and talk about a character that I absolutely despise. That's right, today we're taking one more trip back to Duel Academy to talk about a real piece of work, an absolute scumbag, one royal pain in the ass, Adrian Gecko, Voiced in the English dub by Darren Dunstan, whose most well-known voice role in the Yu-Gi-Oh! universe is definitely that of Maximilian Pegasus, the man responsible for creating Duel Monsters. Adrian was one of several new transfer students brought to Duel Academy in Season 3 of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, designed to shake things up a bit and add some new blood to the cast. But unlike the others, who all became great friends with and indispensable allies to Jaden Yuki and the rest of his friend group, Adrian Gecko was all about Adrian Gecko, always looking for a way to get a ahead no matter who he had to leave behind. As I'm recording this, there's a pretty huge snowstorm happening outside, and we're still a few days out from Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, which may have already come out by the time I get done editing this. So hey, before my channel is completely consumed by Pokemon for the next few months, let's work through the last bit of my current bout of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX brain rot, as we take a look at the character arc of Adrian Gecko from Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, and why I feel like, in the end, he got exactly what he deserved. Oh, and as always, big time heckin' spoilers ahead. Of course, as is always the case here, we need to take a second to establish who Adrian Gecko is first. Adrian Gecko is the eldest son of the Gecko family, who controls a business conglomerate with considerable control of many of the world's most powerful industries, such as petroleum and information technology. Adrian is one of four transfer students who joined Duel Academy's student body in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX's third season, the top students from each of Duel Academy's worldwide branches. Jesse Anderson from North Academy, Academy, Jim Crocodile Cook from South Academy, Axel Brody from West Academy, and of course, Adrian Gecko from East Academy. When he and the other transfers first arrive at Duel Academy, he paints himself as a chill, easygoing party guy, with his very first lines in the show being lamenting about the ship's lack of karaoke machines and all-you-can-eat buffets. Of course, it very quickly becomes very apparent that there's more to him than meets the eye. Especially when you consider that his surname in the dub, Gecko, is more than likely a reference to the character Gordon Gecko from the 1987 film Wall Street, a character infamous for his insatiable greed and the mental gymnastics that he does to justify it. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Trust me, this will be relevant later. Being the top student of East Academy, Adrian Gecko is no slouch when it comes to duel monsters, and that becomes very apparent during his first on-screen duel against everyone's favorite black jacket-wearing, Ojama-hating, catchphrase-spewing rich kid, Chaz Princeton, who picked a fight with Adrian specifically because he was jealous that there was someone at Duel Academy who was richer and more popular than he was. And trust me, the Chaz was not gonna let that stand who cares if he's richer than me and so what if he's more powerful i'm really good at playing card games and that's what life is really all about anyway yeah you tell him chaz um, um, uh, anyway, uh, Chaz challenges Adrian to a duel during the latter's big Duel for Jewels party, where Adrian had a bunch of students duel in a big tournament under the pretense of winning a big golden jewel-covered duel disc, but despite bringing out heavy hitters like his VWXYZ Dragon Catapult Cannon, Adrian duels circles around Chaz using his Cloudian Monsters, an archetype that takes quite a bit of skill to use properly, but when played correctly, can even even reduce Chaz's strongest monsters to scrap metal and blow Chaz's massive ego away in the wind. And I do have to give Adrian credit where it's due here. He does so while also taking a few pretty funny jabs at some common Yu-Gi-Oh cliches. Can we get on with this? Why not? The sooner I beat you, the less bad dialogue I have to hear. I reveal two of my face downs. But how? Easy. I just call out their names dramatically and they pop up. 
Haven't you played this game before? Because it's a pretty common occurrence. Then we've got problems. I've never felt this run down after a duel. Why does everyone think out loud at this place? Now, you might think that it's weird that a guy named Adrian Gecko is using a deck full of cloud monsters and, you know, not something that involves reptiles, but you do have to remember that that's just his name in the English dub. His name in the original Japanese version is Amon Garam, with the given name, Amon, being an alternate spelling of Amun, the name of an Egyptian cloud deity, which might clue you in just a little bit more about Adrian's true desires. Not to mention the fact that Cloudian cards often involve the use of fog counters, which kind of plays thematically into the fact that Adrian often acts in a way that clouds people's judgment about him and fogs up their vision so that they can't see the truth and uh, so they can't be ready for the storm clouds to roll in. Oh, whatever, you get the point. It's not too long before it becomes apparent that Adrian's not just at Duel Academy to throw big shindigs and poke fun at card game anime tropes. No, see, he's really there to thwart the plans of the really incredibly obviously evil Thelonious Viper, who was using his bio bands to drain the life force of Duel Academy students for some nefarious purpose, as well as to obtain a mysterious and powerful card that Viper supposedly has. In order to do that though, he's not very shy about getting others to do his dirty work, like when he manipulates Jaden and his friends to head to Viper's base before he does, so they can trip all the traps and create a diversion, you know, so he can sneak in later and take his sweet ass time flipping through the lasers like he's Leon from Resident Evil 4. Oh, and that duel for Jules party? He only threw that party because Viper was gonna crank up the Bioband's energy collection to 11, which would have been fatal in order to keep Adrian from sussing out his plans, but having a huge party with 80 plus students dueling all at once would have caused a huge chunk of the student body to die on the spot, which would have ruined Viper's plot completely. Brilliant strategies, though these may have been, these are just two examples of Adrian happily using others to his own benefit, not really caring who might get caught in the crossfire, so long as he gets what he wants which is a pretty stark contrast from his childhood. See, Adrian may be the eldest son of the Gecko family, but he's not his parents' true heir because he wasn't their true son. Adrian was adopted by the Gecko family after being abandoned as a child in the desert and was raised as if he were their true son, given that they had no biological child of their own. Adrian wanted so badly to be loved by his new parents. He even took up boxing and became quite good at it just because he knew his new dad was a sports guy. However, it wasn't long before the Geckos conceived their own child, Shido, who would become their true heir something that did not sit well at all with Adrian. He became angry and resentful towards his new little brother for taking away all the love and affirmation he felt that he deserved, that he'd earned from the geckos. And at one point, he even contemplated killing Shido in order to ensure his place as the gecko's one true son, but decided against it, instead resigning himself to work for his younger brother's sake perhaps in the hope that, by doing this, and guiding Shido through life, he could still gain that precious validation from his adoptive parents that he so desperately craved. But there was only so much that Adrian could do to mask his true desires, as deep down in his heart, he'd always have that same need for validation and love, which festered and grew into a lust for power and control as he grew older. And that desire for power would only become more prominent later on. All he needed to bring it out was a very special friend. With me. Yeah, so believe it or not, Thelonious Viper, the guy who was so overtly evil that even the show itself was making fun of how obvious it was. Oh man, something's not right about this. What gave that away? The maniacal laugh or the creepy music? Yeah, he wasn't the big bad of season three. In fact, he was only around for a cup of coffee before getting snuffed out by the real primary villain. Yubel. Yubel is a mysterious duel monster spirit that, for some reason, really wants to make Jade and Yuki suffer, and to that end, they tend to manipulate those around them into doing what they want and often toss them aside once they've outlived their usefulness. 
Does that sound like anyone we know? Of course, Adrian and Yubel have a bit more in common than their tendency to use people like pawns on a chessboard. They have both felt abandoned and left behind by those they loved, and wanted so desperately to be loved by. Maybe it's that common bond that caused Adrian to ditch his plan to shut down Viper's bioband power supply, leaving it on so that the bands could continue to sap dual energy to restore Yubel's body, with Yubel promising to grant Adrian the great power he desired. Of course, he couldn't let the main characters know that he was Yubel's new accomplice, so he went right on manipulating Jaden and his friend group making himself into another one of his reliable allies, all just to gain their trust before he would eventually make his big move. In order to achieve that ruse, he agreed to help look for a submarine that was sucked into the Duel Monsters dimension along with Duel Academy to look for supplies, just so he could use its computer to erase anything that could be traced back to him and his plans. And once the Academy became overrun by Yubel's mysterious duel ghouls, of course Adrian stepped up to be the big hero to buy the other's time to escape, but conveniently only did so when there was only one ghoul in the room to deal with. Everything Adrian did to help Jaden, and for that matter everything he did in his service to Yubel, was all calculated, just giving enough of himself to make them both think he was on their side before he would ultimately make his big move and reign over both of them, along with everyone else. And surely he believed that time came in episode 126, when he confronted Yubel, now possessing the body of Marcel Bonaparte, cutting Yubel off before they could break the seal containing the incredibly dangerous sacred beast car. However, during their duel, Adrian saw that Yubel had access to another great power, one of the few even greater than the Sacred Beasts, the Unstoppable Exodia. Yes, the very same Exodia that, both in the anime universe and the actual card game, results in an instant win if you can gather all five pieces of the Forbidden One in your hand at one time. Yubel had these very same cards in their possession, and that's the kind of power that someone like Adrian not only wanted, but felt like he deserved. Before I go any further though, there's someone I've kind of been neglecting to talk about, which is kind of a travesty considering how important she is to Adrian's story, that being his childhood friend and longtime accomplice, Echo. Echo has known Adrian since he was first adopted by the Gecko family and has always been by his side, growing to fiercely adore his strength and determination and admire how often he was willing to put others before himself even as she had to watch helplessly as his family pushed him aside for their biological son. As Adrian starts pursuing his own desires, Echo supports him wholeheartedly, believing that he deserved everything he desired and more, especially after how often he'd put what he wanted aside for the good of others. She even went as far as threatening to destroy a one-of-a-kind duel monster tablet of the legendary Rainbow Dragon, which still needed to be made into an actual card to get Duel Academy back to its own dimension, it's Yu-Gi-Oh, just go with it. Believing that Adrian would be better off as a king in a dimension of dual monsters, rather than going back to being subservient to his family's will in this world. And later on in Season 3, when the main characters meet up with Echo, after Jaden's brief heel run as the Supreme King a few episodes back, it's revealed that Echo actually carries around a locket with Adrian's picture in it, and she has no qualms telling Aster Phoenix right to his face that Adrian was his better and that he was smarter and stronger than Aster and everyone else. It's painfully obvious that Echo's devotion to Adrian went far beyond companionship and friendship. She flat out loved him and would do just about anything to see him take what she felt was his rightful place standing at the top of the world. That much was pretty clear to anyone who spoke to Echo for more than zero seconds, but unfortunately for Echo... That was also pretty clear to Adrian. Suddenly, in episode 144, the main characters are all transported to an underground cave and are met by someone who had been off screen for over a dozen episodes in a whole story arc. 
the one and thankfully only Adrian Gecko. Most of the group is kind of just surprised that he's there, but Zane Truesdale immediately senses that this smarmy weirdo who literally entered the scene by walking out of the shadows probably isn't to be trusted. And to be fair, he's completely right to say that. See, Adrian didn't come back to the original dimension with the others after Jesse's rainbow dragon helped open a portal for the others to get home. Rather, he stayed in this dimension of his own will, seeking out the prison of one of the mightiest forces known to man or duel monster. And a power strong enough to rid himself of you, Bell, Exodia, the Forbidden One. And he begins talking to his dear, sweet friend Echo, appealing to her emotions and her devotion to him to help him unlock Exodia's power so that he can take his rightful place as the king of this world. And all she has to do, of course, is sacrifice her own dual energy, aka her actual life force to Exodia to free him from his prison. Except this was kind of a massive fucking lie, because just a few minutes ago, when Adrian was down here by himself, he confirmed that freeing Exodia just required someone to sacrifice their dual energy. Unlike at this point, when he's now falsely specifying to Echo that it requires the dual energy of someone close to him. I spoke earlier about Adrian's willingness to throw others under the bus to get what he wanted, but even back then, he was still wearing the mask of a trustworthy friend. At this point though, the mask had not only slipped off, but he may as well have just thrown the mask into a trash can and had it obliterated by Exodia. This dude was in full-blown manipulative scumbag mode, knowingly, blatantly twisting Echo's love and devotion to him in the motivation to kill herself just so that he can reach his ultimate goals, knowing full well that she'd do absolutely anything for him and caring nothing Nothing about whether or not she gets to live long enough to actually see him achieve those goals. Just look at how, during an impromptu duel with Aster Phoenix, Adrian shows pretty much no emotion as Echo willingly walks herself under the proverbial altar, driven only by her devotion and loyalty and completely unrequited love for Adrian Gecko. No concern as she cries in pain, being crushed in the greedy hands of Exodia as her life force is being slowly drained away. No, see, all Adrian cares about now is making sure he can summon forth Exodia with his new deck, which not only includes the Exodia pieces, but also Exodius, the ultimate forbidden lord, as a backup plan in case the original Exodia strategy doesn't work. And that backup plan does pay dividends, as he's eventually able to outmaneuver all of Aster's brilliant tactics and his strongest destiny heroes, using Exodius's effect to send the Exodia pieces to his graveyard, allowing Adrian to win the duel, break Exodia's seal, and obliterate Aster Phoenix. Side note here, but good god, Oliver Wyman really put his whole heart into the voice acting for Aster's death scene. Hey, Plasma! What say we go out with a bang? God damn, Oliver. Nice job. Way to earn that paycheck, dude. Adrian had gotten exactly what he wanted. Power, control, recognition, the ability to rule an entire world and have everyone in it fear the sound of his name. And all it cost him was the only friend he ever really had. But surely all he had to do now was defeat Ubel, so all of this would be worth it. Right? Just a few episodes after Adrian's descent into scumbaggery, Ubel, now possessing the body of the long since absent Jesse Anderson, finds him sitting on their throne, and the two engage in a rare heel versus heel duel, with Adrian sure that he had it in the bag with Exodia. In fact, his actual opening hand had all four of Exodia's limbs, which means he would have just needed to draw the head in order to win. However, Jesse Ubel activated the anime version of Hand Destruction, forcing Adrian to send three of those limbs to the graveyard before he even had his first turn. In fact, half of this duel was just Jesse Ubel preventing 
complimenting Adrian for executing his Exodia strategy. Not even just the straightforward one, but also the backup strategy with Exodius the Ultimate Forbidden Lord. You know, it's honestly kind of ironic how Adrian, for all of his manipulation, calculated strategies, and willingness to play the long game, apparently never accounted for the possibility that Ubel would be super ready to counter Exodia when they're the one who more or less gave him Exodia in the first place. And Ubel wastes no time rubbing this into Adrian's face. How he was so reliant on his precious Exodia to secure him the victory and the power to rule this dimension, and yet Ubel had already rendered it useless making his dear Echo sacrifice all for naught. Despite Ubel's preparedness for Exodia though, the duel is fairly back and forth, more so than Ubel would like, given that their duel energy was still pretty low due to the intense match they had just had with Zane Truesdale, and they were hoping to use the darkness of Adrian's heart to restore themselves to their full power before Jade and Yuki arrived. However, when they searched Adrian's heart for darkness, they found... nothing no darkness at all. You see, much like when, back in episode 145, Jaden assumed that Adrian's recent actions were the result of him being corrupted by a dark power, much like Jaden was when he became the Supreme King, Adrian said proudly that there was no corrupting darkness inside him, and everything he was doing was of his own clear mind and free will. Oh, well, that's good then, that we have total confirmation that you're just a natural scumbag. Oh, and don't even get me started on the whole, oh, but I did what I did to have the power to create a world devoid of pain and suffering excuse because while there may be a bit of truth to that, after all, Adrian's earliest years were surely full of suffering before being picked up by the geckos, you cannot tell me that Adrian's primary motivation, his innermost desire, wasn't to achieve unlimited power for unlimited power's sake, wanting to create a world in which he is worshipped and revered and to be loved the way that he should have been as a child. How I ironic then that someone who was so desperate to be loved and validated threw away the one person in his life who could have given that to him unconditionally. Echo, whose very life force was snuffed out to give Adrian the power to command Exodia. Her memory now nothing more than an echo in his cold black heart. And I'm not the only one calling out Adrian for this either, because even Ubel takes the time to mock and belittle Adrian for being so willing to make Echo suffer without being willing to suffer himself. It's the biggest indication to them that, while Echo loved Adrian dearly, that love was clearly not reciprocated. And while Yubel is obviously speaking as someone with a very warped and sadomasochistic view of love, believing that causing the other person pain and suffering is the purest expression of love and affection, they're still not super wrong for calling out Adrian for snuffing out the one person who ever truly loved him, because all he really cared about was himself. And it was that selfishness that led to Adrian's ultimate undoing. See, while there may have been no darkness in Adrian's heart, there was some in his deck. The last remnants of Echo's spirit, having fused itself with Adrian's cards upon her body's demise, still carried with it a significant darkness. Pain, anger, bitterness, and resentment all from knowing that the man she loved would be so willing to use her to gain power and then cast her aside like she was nothing, when she was the only person on earth who was always by his side, who always loved him. And yet, it seemed like he just had no love to give back. Yubel fed off that darkness, drawing the Duel Monsters version of themselves and beckoning the darkness of Echo's soul to attack Yubel on the field, activating one of Yubel's effects, dealing any battle damage back to the opponent. And thus, Adrian's greatest mistake, his callous, selfish choice to throw away Echo's life for his own desires led to him losing everything he'd thrown her away for. You know, the story of Adrian and Echo reminds me a little bit of something from Greek mythology. A story that tells of a nymph named Echo, who fell deeply in love with a hunter named Narcissus, but he scorned her and rejected her affections, causing her to wander the forest for the rest of her days in utter heartbreak, until her body wasted away leaving only the echo of her voice behind. And as for Narcissus himself, he caught a glimpse of himself in a pool of water's reflection one day and... well, he just never left. He couldn't. 
he was so madly in love with himself, with his own image and beauty, that he died upon that very spot, his insatiable love for himself being his own undoing. And while the story obviously isn't an exact one-for-one -one parallel, there's still enough similarities between them. A woman named Echo devoting herself to a selfish, narcissistic man who tossed her aside and rejected her love, for he had none to give anyone but himself. And in that pursuit of his own desires, he ultimately found only his self-destruction. And I'm sorry, but I just have no sympathy for Adrian's last-second plea for Echo's forgiveness as Yubel wins the duel. I mean, sure, it's pretty dramatic that his last words were saying sorry to Echo, but hey, uh, Adrian, you want to know when it probably would have been a good time to apologize or show remorse to Echo? Probably right around the time you killed her to get Exodia, you fuck! Adrian showed so little emotion and absolutely zero remorse or concern for his one and only friend in this world as she suffered for his desires and his end goals, caring nothing for the one person who ever supported him unconditionally, who metaphorically and quite literally gave her entire life to ensure he got the power he craved. And the fact that he only shows any kind of remorse when his Exodia strategy goes down the drain and it's already way too late to do anything to fix it? I'm sorry, man, but no. Apology not accepted. Fuck off, eat shit, go directly to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200. While there were objectively more powerful and dangerous villains in GX, there's no doubt that Adrian Gecko was one of the most selfish, self-serving people in probably the entire Yu-Gi-Oh! universe, willing to throw everyone, from his closest companions to total strangers, right under the bus, if it meant he could get what he wanted, caring nothing for the well-being of others if he got what he craved. But in the end, for all of his plotting and scheming and manipulation and sacrificing others' lives, all he really got in return was everything he deserved. Okay, I think I've driven it home pretty hard that I'm not a fan of Adrian Gecko, but what about you guys? Do you think Adrian could have been redeemed? You know, if he maybe hadn't waited until the last second to show remorse? Let me know in the comments below. Give this video a like if you liked it, subscribe for more completely selfless videos like this in the future, share this on your favorite social medias, and ring the bell so you always get notified when I upload. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video, friendos.